Uh, welcome to Uncolored. I'm Kevin Metcalf, and I have a special treat today. If you've been following the channel, you know that I've been going through this book, How Reason Can Lead to God. Uh, and I was able to finagle the author of the book, Dr. Joshua Rasmussen, a young, talented, handsome philosopher about town to come on uh, the channel for a few minutes and talk with me about various stuff, not necessarily about the book, but just general ideas. Uh, and he was kind enough to give us some of his time, for which I appreciate. But before I get into that, I wanted to tell you about one of the books that he wrote with his wife, Rachel Rasmussen. And it's a book that, you know, it's not my kind of book necessarily, at least that's what I thought, because it's a fiction book. And uh, if I'm going to read a fiction book, you know, it's got to have explosions and knife fights, gunplay, that kind of stuff. Um, so initially, it wasn't something I was going to get into, but I figured he's coming on the channel so I could at least get a broader sampling of some of the things that he's done. So I read the book. I got to tell you, it's a knockout. Um, the, the book is called When Heaven Invades Hell. And what it does is it is, is it does uh, kind of in the in the vein of Dostoevsky uh, Dostoevsky with um, the brothers Karamazov or Crime and Punishment, where he uses the story as a vehicle uh, to bring ideas and have characters represent specific ideas. And I got to tell you, it, it's a brilliant book. You know. Fiction is not easy to write, and I don't know if it was Rachel or Joshua or both of them together, but very, very, very talented writers. They're able to bring these characters um, in such a short time to really flesh them out, uh, and you can see the contrast from different characters, from their past. It's, it's, uh, it's really great how they did it. But the amazing thing is that they take ideas and bring in factors that don't necessarily, you, you can't necessarily capture them in a syllogism. Um, ideas, emotions, perspectives that um, really need to be brought forth from a character in the story. Um, fantastic story. And it starts out with, <laughs> it starts out pretty, not basic, but the idea, it's a very popular idea, it's well argued, and you're like, well, that that makes sense, where are you going to go from here? And then they just kick doors in. 844, knock and notice, Rachel and Joshua Rasmussen start knocking down walls, kicking in doors, punching people in the heart. It, 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 it's a, it's, the characters bring forth these ideas in sometimes an overpowering manner. And I was at uh, uh, the, the Habit Burger Place. Los Banos, California, coming back from uh, traveling and uh, reading the book in the restaurant. I almost had to get up and leave. It was so powerful at this one point. Um, you're going to be challenged. And if you are come from a particular orthodoxy, you're really going to be challenged. It's going to shake. It's going to grab you by the shirt collar and start shaking you around. And that might be the best thing for you. Um, if you're not a Christian, if you're a Buddhist, whatever your belief system, there's something in the book for you. I could not highly recommend this book, When Heaven Invades Hell. Um, it makes you think. And the idea, I think, is a game changer. It really is. Uh, and I'm glad because it resonates with me, uh, not personally, but there's something innate about the idea that has always resonated with me, but I never really heard that side of it argued. So uh, very thankful for the book. Joshua and Rachel Rasmussen, When Heaven Invades Hell. Get it, read it, you're going to love it. Uh, so without further ado, this is Dr. Joshua Rasmussen, who graciously uh, gave of his time to spend a few minutes with me talking about various issues, and I hope you enjoy the interview as much as I did. All right. Well, today, um, uh, you're, you'll be surprised. I have a wonderful guest. I, I can't be more excited to have uh, this guest with you, as you can see, this is Dr. Joshua Rasmussen, who was an icon of mine. Um, and as I started learning these things, Dr. Rasmussen was one of the, the folks that I glommed onto because one, he can deal with these topics at the very highest level, but also he can write in such a way that people like me can, can kind of gain purchase on the bottom level and sort of understand the ideas. And I see Dr. Rasmussen as, to me, uh, probably one of the, the giants in philosophy because he's, he's got an explorer's mentality, as it seems to me, 
rather than somebody who just has some ideology that they're trying to defend. And I think those are the best ideas. So enough of me, you, you know, I'm, I'm a knucklehead. Let's uh, say hello to Dr. Rasmussen. How are you doing, Dr. Rasmussen? Hi, I'm doing great. Uh, thanks for having me on. It's just wonderful to be with you. And I appreciate your interest. I appreciate your appreciation for having ideas that are more accessible, um, that can reach a wider audience. And that is also exploratory. Because right. that's something that I really do care about is trying to offer a pathway for people to explore. Because I feel like I'm always learning more things, you know, and I feel like if I can present the steps and the pathway for people to test for themselves, you know, rather than me say, hey, here's what you need to believe, right. test this, see, see if this holds up in your own mind. And I always tell people like, if, if it looks like by your own light, that step doesn't seem solid, don't take that step. Because right. I think in the long term, you're going to get more out of your journey. If you pay attention to what seems true by your own light, you'll, you'll know more that way, I think. Right. It, it's a, one of the things that really kind of blew me away because <clears throat> my first um, exposure to debates, you know, I don't want to say contentious, but you know, there's my side and there's your side. Mm -hmm. And this is why you're wrong. This is why I'm right, which is the way a lot of debate goes. When I see you in discussions, there's a whole different approach. I shouldn't say whole different. It appears to me that, again, and I, I mentioned it earlier, it's like you're just an explorer yeah. and you're just looking to see what's out there and you're not really defending anything. You're just saying, this is how it seems. And your ability, and I've seen you do this a couple of times, you even said this outright where you're trying to make, I don't want to say your opponent, but the person who's has a different side, mm -hmm. you actually try to make their argument as strong as it could be which I found interests me. What, how do you get there? Walk me through that process. Yeah, I like to have those conversations. So, you know, I feel like if I'm having a conversation, I'm going to learn the most. If I interact with the other person, not as my enemy, right? Not as my tone opponent, but kind of more like an ally and constructing greater understanding. That's how I see it. And I just want to say, Kevin, I have great respect for people who know how to do that formal debate where they're defending a position, um, and showing the other position, you know, knocking down the other position. It's, it, that's a kind of intellectual play that I, I appreciate those who can do that and who do that well. But I've, I've sort of gravitated toward a different style because I feel like there's already this display of debates. Like that feels so familiar. We already know like kind of how that works or something. And I feel like I've thought that if we can have open conversations, we can just make more progress together. We can discover more together. Right, I think right. people sometimes get stuck. So that's something that I care a lot about. Um, and I think that does lead to a different kind, kind of conversation. I mean, what do you think? Have you had conversations where you felt like it was hard to make progress in the conversation? And then like, what do you do? What, what is your strategy in that case? So for me, you know, I, I was, it, it, I don't know if you know or not, but I, I, was, I was a cop for 30 years. And so I'm constantly regularly in contentious situations, either with two other people or with me. And my response was, it's, for me, it's more of about uh, efficiency. Either I'm in a place where I'm gonna be making progress here or I'm not because they're mm -hmm. shut, their feet are dug in. And so it's just time to move on to something else. Mm -hmm. Because once one or both parties are dug in, then it, there's really no, no benefit to continuing the conversation. As a matter of fact, only bad things can happen at that point. So mm -hmm. for me, I, I usually move on, but I also have to remember sometimes I'm the, the reason why it's dug in because I've locked myself in. And one of the things I really appreciate about you is that you're fearless. When you come into a discussion or an idea, there, there's no fear that, oh no, I may lose something if the other person has something that's true or right. Mm -hmm. You're like, well, if that's the case, I need to, 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 to look at that. And that, I'll tell you, that was a big leap for me, it, it, mm -hmm. that courage that you have. And a lot of people don't, at least I don't see that a lot. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate that. One thing that I've noticed is that when somebody else admits that they've made a mistake, other people who are watching that don't usually look down on that person. In right. fact, it's almost like the opposite. It's kind of attractive. It shows your own confidence, your own self-assuredness right. that you can just like admit that you've made a mistake. So I think like once I realized that it made it so that I didn't really have that fear. It's like, in fact, actually, if I 
find out that I've made a mistake, I can advertise that. Now, this is not how you win debates, right? I've not seen somebody win a debate by saying, oh, that's that's a great point. This is why I don't think I would do so well uh, in that context. But to have a fun conversation where, hey, that's that's a great point, And I want to think more about that. Right. I, I've seen this done at conferences. So philosophers will give talks. And then the goal at the conference for the people watching the talk is to come up with an objection. I always tell people that the philosophers love language is uh, arguing with each other. That's how we feel loved, you know, so <laughs> so that that happens at the conferences. And um, and I have to say that the speakers who come across to me as the most impressive are the ones who are taking notes and they're quick to say, hey, you know, that's a good point. Um, I'll have to think more about that. And so because I think that leads to collective learning. Right. Um, so I think that that's kind of where I get that from is just realizing People don't look down on you if you admit to making a mistake. In fact, it's kind of the opposite. It's like people want to know that you're really chasing the truth. Right. I think that's the difference. Like if you're just trying to defend something, then the pattern of a defender is that they never move. But if you really want the true truth, I've been thinking about this lately, that if you really want the truth, it's probably unlikely that you already have all true beliefs. That's right. So it's probable that if you're after the truth, that you're going to be updating your viewpoints on things right. um so so if you do that in a conversation that could signal that you're interested in the truth um if it's sincere you know that, that's interesting you say that because <clears throat> from this book uh not only how reasons lead to god i see a couple of i saw a couple of interesting twists that you took that i had not seen before not to say they haven't been done before but i i hadn't read them before and also in this book when heaven invades hell mm -hmm you're you're not it seems like orthodoxy is not your thing that doesn't hold you back you're you go wherever the ideas lead wherever they yeah, lead that's a courageous if it, thing if it, if it coincides with an orthodox view uh you know that's so be it right and if it right. departs then so be it let's just see where it goes yeah right yeah that's a very courageous thing to do one other thing i i, I wanted to ask you about your personal style that that mm -hmm. intrigues me you one of the things that I saw you do a couple of times, and I don't remember the this the the last gentleman you were talking to. It's, it was a it was a guy who I wish I was a young muscular black guy from England who was a very brilliant brilliant philosopher. I can't pronounce his name, and I, I don't forgot it. Oh, but. Joshua. Um, yeah, the last name. I'm, I apologize for that, but yeah. Yeah, I, when you were talking with him, I, and I'll, I'll be honest, I don't know most of what you guys were saying to each other. Mm -hmm. But there was a couple of points where when you were, you know, offering uh, some ideas, I could see you stop and you would like reflect, you know, in yourself, you go, well, I, I would look and examine my own ideas. These are different aspects or ways of God manifesting or being. So, so for example, omnipotence is the window, uh, is God through the window of power. Um, omniscience is God through the window of knowledge. Uh, moral perfection is God through the window of goodness, you know, and so maybe our own concepts um, give us the windows to look at God. But the idea here is that these are really distinct as aspects from each other, but they're pointing to a common core, which is, and this goes to your argument, Josh, which is uh, the ground of those aspects. This is something I've been thinking a lot about lately is how the, the fundamental reality could be itself the ground of its of its aspects um, so that truly the foundational reality is simple um, because its very aspects are not foundational. They're grounded in it, if that makes sense. And, and it's almost if I get the impression that philosophy is more than just some abstract exercise for you, that mm -hmm. there's something real and... Uh, tangible about it yeah that i that i don't always see am, am i making more of it or, or is there something there well i like to try to build my view of the world um like i have this working model in my mind like my worldview and so when i'm in conversations yeah it's not just this abstract intellectual play although i mean there is that you know it's like chess it can be just fun right but um but i really am trying to understand like what's true about the world and kind of like about the big questions and yeah i remember that conversation because I remember he was bringing up points that were making me think about other ways of looking at things. And I was trying to reflect, you know, okay, well, can I fit this into my view? Does that work? Does it fit? Is that possible?
Right. Maybe that's what you were seeing. Yeah, that's there. it's a it's a fascinating thing that I it's almost like um it's the difference between I don't know uh, a baker just showing you the cake that they've made and then actually watching them make the cake. It's mm -hmm. it's a nice little bit of window into that. Oh yeah, that's a good that's a good metaphor because I do think sometimes people package their ideas and they only want to bring them into the public right. when they're sort of ready to advertise. Right. Right. But that's a good point. And I hadn't thought as much about this, but like, you know, what is the process of developing those ideas? What does that look like? Right. And I think you were seeing in that conversation was, yeah, sort of a live, you know, th th this is kind of how it looks when philosophers get, to get together and have our conversations. Like we're trying to figure things out together, right? right? We don't have it all worked out. So we're kind of exploring with each other. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that's that's fascinating to see the whole world of ideas on this level and the impact that they really have on how the world really is. And, and you know, again, up until I guess about seven years ago, um, I, I, I guess it was Ben Shapiro, somebody like that mentioned this debate against with uh, Craig and uh, Sam Harris. And I hadn't even heard of William Lane Craig at that point. And, uh, and so I, I started listening to this and I, and it blew me away because Dr. Craig's um, arguments were so simple. And I thought, well, yeah, that totally makes sense. And then I thought, well, Sam Harris will probably have, you know, he's written books and stuff like that. I'm sure he'll be able to, and there was just nothing. And after that, I, I got sucked into this world of ideas where, where you philosophers are I don't know if it's building or discovering, but it's 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 almost like going into a new territory and creating mm -hmm. this thing that's that wasn't there before, although it was already there. I don't really know how to explain it, but it's just amazing to see and mm -hmm. the applicability, which is one of the reasons why I started the channel is, I think it's something that we do every day. It's, it's almost like the difference between me going out to the, the neighborhood park and playing basketball with a bunch of old guys like me and you being like, you know, Michael Jordan playing it on the highest level. Mm -hmm. We're kind of doing the same things. It's just that you're doing it at a much higher level. And, and there's, I felt like there's just so much to learn from how you guys interact with these ideas and how mm -hmm. applicable they are to what we do every day. That's really cool. You know, so there was the debates that kind of got you into this. And then what did you start kind of reading after that or watching? The, 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 I, I focused on probably 10, 12 of Dr. Craig's debates, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the cosmological argument. Um, and it, it was so stunning, but <laughs> it's the same five arguments every single time. Mm -hmm. It's not like he was coming up with something new. <laughs> it was the same argument every time uh -huh. and, and nobody had anything for these. And so I went from there to um, Dr. Edward Fazer has a book called uh, Five Proofs for the Existence of God. Mm -hmm. I've seen that, yeah. And it's, again, as I'm looking to these ideas of, you know, the problems with an infinite regress and, and how do things stay, questions I'd never asked myself before. And suddenly all these good questions like, you know, who created God, it seems suddenly stupid. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like it was some trick or that. It's just really some basic logical principles. And if you apply them, suddenly things become clearer. And so yeah. that's where I start. And then and in your book, How Reason Can Lead to God, those kinds of movies, um, On Guard, those kinds of books mm -hmm. really just built up a foundation that these, these ideas, you can, you can engage God intellectually. And so God became real to me, not just as kind of as a thing that I've been taught when I was a kid and I'm, you know, a, a, an emotional belief. God became as real to me as the table I'm sitting in front of mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm just because it would be logically impossible, it seems for a God not to be real. Mm -hmm. and, and I cannot thank you guys. I, I couldn't tell you how much I thank you guys for doing mm -hmm. that, that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, there is something about kind of thinking through sort of logical links between observations and then coming to see that, oh, okay, it looks like God is real in the way that tables and chairs are real. It's not just something you sort of make up from your private experience, like, no, there's an actually an objective way to investigate that, right. you know, and then, you know, people will investigate these things by their own light. So people will come to different uh, viewpoints. Right. There's very intelligent people. I was going to ask you, did, did you watch Craig um, and Tooley's debate by chance? No. His, that, that was, he did two of them with Michael Tooley, um, I believe. And I, if I'm remembering right, I think his second one, I thought, uh, Thule did a, a very fine job 
And uh, I mean, Craig, Craig did great, but I thought that, you know, if there was a debate between the two where um, maybe there were some rejoinders there that could cause sort of further steps in the analysis, um, I thought that was, that was one. And what maybe part of that, that, yeah, go ahead. Well, no, what were some of the things that Tuli brought up if you don't mind? Well, um, it's, I'd have to go back and, and oh, remember no, exactly, that's... but I remember on the cosmological argument, um, Thule had some objections that I thought kind of pushed the discussion farther okay. than it than what it usually is. And I think maybe part of that is that they were speaking maybe a, a more common language of philosophy. So they were, there was more of that linking, whereas some of Craig's debates would be with public intellectuals who aren't necessarily professional philosophers. Right. And so there might be a little bit more of that disconnect where the public intellectual might be very, very skilled at organizing ideas into persuasive form, but they may not connect quite so well with Craig's particular style. So anyway, I thought that, that was uh, the Thule debate was pretty good. Um, I'll have to look into that one. So, so can I ask a more personal question? How did yeah. you, of all the things that a, a young, handsome man like yourself could have gotten into, clearly you're brilliant, all kinds of things, what brought you to philosophy? Well, for me, I think curiosity, fundamentally. Um, I didn't even know there was such a thing as philosophy until I think it was like the internet or something came out when I was in high school. And then I started reading some of these debates. I found William Lane Craig's debates. Now, at that time, none of them were on videos that I could find, but um, but I read the transcripts of them. And were you a Christian found, at the time? At that time, well, there was a period of doubt, as you write in my book. Um, so there was a point where I was not and then a point that I was. Mm -hmm. But I, I remember discovering uh, Robert Kuhn's a philosopher. He had some lecture notes online mm. and I was like reading all of his lecture notes. And um, then I began to discover this thing called philosophy. And I remember going to the library, just checking out books by different philosophers from different perspectives. And so I would say, yeah, it's just fundamentally curiosity. I was a computer programmer before I got into philosophy. So for me, programming was about creating and problem solving and kind of building an environment, which I always thought was interesting. Um, but then I, I felt like I would have these questions and I can't answer them through computer programming, you know, and then science is great, but science sort of takes you to these edges where it's like, okay, well, now but, we're. yeah, I mean, and sometimes there's these blurry lines where you're not sure whether to call it science or, or philosophy, but I wanted to go all the way to the foundations. And so that's where, philosophy sort of took hold yeah interesting and, and so if you're <clears throat> and not to necessarily try to pin you down but if you're at your identity as a philosopher what do you what would you say you are what am i trying to do how, how are you different from other philosophers what's what's your mm -hmm. thing so uh, two things so first i think philosophers in general do want to get to the truth i think that is something we would care a lot about um, and so that is a, that is a driver in me. Like, I'm just curious, like I want to know more. My area of focus would be sort of the foundations of things. So, um, sometimes metaphysics or theory of the nature of things and kind of my distinctive interest would focus on like, what is the fundamental nature of a mind? What is the fundamental nature of existence? And it's interesting because people know me sort of for my work in the philosophy of religion. And now I'm working on this book in the philosophy of mind. But I think part of that is because those are um, areas that connect up with big questions people are asking. They're wondering, what is the ultimate nature of reality? Right. Um, you know, who am I? What is the nature of my mind? But my, my sort of core interest is it's almost like it's in building parts of an engine. So it's like, it is like the nature of parts and holes or the nature of propositions or the nature of, of numbers. Like, that was always kind of my, my, my original interest. And so I find that I, I'm applying my interest in these most basic things to these big questions that people are asking. Hmm. So if I could sort of boil it all down, I would say, I want to try to uncover insights about things that really matter the most to people. That's kind of my purpose statement. It's like that to help people to understand a depth of insight about things that matter most. That's what animates me. That's interesting. That's I think that's wonderful. Like I said, I, you know, latching on to, to you and, and some other folks in philosophy has really changed my, and it's not so much my 
my understanding of a world for how to build a worldview. But the fact that you have a responsibility to build a worldview, mm -hmm. yeah. I think most people walk around thinking I am just what I am or whatever I learned and that they don't really think that they can build or have the responsibility for the ideas that make up their worldview. And that was something that you enlightened me to. Well, thank you. Yeah, that is something that I would often tell my students about that, you know, you are the only one who owns your worldview. Right. And you almost have to stop to like realize that like nobody else can give you your own worldview. You might think other people are giving you your worldview because maybe there's some other testimony that, you know, you're trusting them, but then you have to discern who to trust. Right. You know, I mean, if you get your worldview from the Bible, for example, but then it's part of your worldview that the Bible is a trustworthy source right. and that's on you. You have to have responsibility to figure that out. Nobody else can do that. Right. And that does get me kind of passionate about it because I think once you really take responsibility for building your worldview, that's where I think you'll actually get more power to see more that's for yourself. And then you become a leader for others. So I tell people that the struggles that you have are not just for you. If you can work through your own struggles in life, whatever they are, right. uh, whatever victories you have, you're going to then have that victory for others. You're going to help others get that victory. Right. So I think that's, for me, worldview development is about trying to understand things that really matter to people. Right. And it gets to the truth because, you know, you don't want to just believe what you hope to be true. Exactly. Right. <laughs> that's always the, <laughs> the, the conflict in a way, you know, you want to get to the actual truth. It, you know, I, I always tell folks, because I, I have people, again, like you, Craig, uh, who, who I, you know, if, if I'm trying to learn something, like there's a guy named uh, Mike Winger. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm looking through the Bible, or I want to learn, you know, maybe go through Matthew or, or Rome. I like Mike Winger because he has he has humility. He seems to just look at the, the word. So he's somebody who I again, don't know, know that I agree with everything that he says, but I, I, I like his approach to the Bible. So that's somebody I trust. Uh, but at the bottom line, he won't be standing between me and God on that day. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to be the one who has to whatever. I feel like, you know what, if, if, you know, if I'm wrong, I'd rather be wrong because I was wrong uh -huh. than because I was listening to somebody else who was wrong. And so that's why I feel like, again, my worldview is my ID, my responsibility. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until I started looking into philosophy that I understood I think there's an objective way to build an accurate picture of the world, which, which leads me to one question you have. There's two ways of understanding reality. There is a, I, there's one where it's objective, like the, the world out there is objective. Don't know what the name of it is. And then there's a one where it's a subjective or not objective. What, mm -hmm. what, what am I talking about? You know what I'm mentioning? Well, there's a view called realism with respect to the world. Mm -hmm. um, so in my book on the, correspondence theory of truth i talk about realism that okay. the world is sort of objectively there independently of your mind um, okay. or really anybody else's mind um depending on how you understand that but uh whereas yeah an object an objective view versus a subjective view with respect to reality is also different than an objective versus subjective view with respect to truth um okay. because one of the points that I, I made there it's kind of a subtle distinction but you could have an objectivist view of truth and a subjectivist view of reality where the idea is that truth can objectively correspond with subjective uh, realities. Um, or you can go the other way. You can have a subjectivist view of truth and objectivist view of reality where the nature of truth is subjective, varies from person to person, but the nature of reality is um, objective. Okay. I uh, guess got a message. This thing's going to cut off in 10 minutes for some oh. reason. Okay, well, I think that we've got 10 minutes to have a great conversation, then we can okay. start it up again. <laughs> so, so let's end on this one then. <clears throat> determinism. I've been spending a little bit of time on determinism. And I think it's one of the worst ideas out there. It, it seems that once you hold on to this idea, mm -hmm. suddenly knowledge is gone, truth is gone, all of these things are gone. Am I overstating that? Or is there something to determinism that makes it so attractive to so many people? Well, that's a, a big question because it, everything's sort of connected. So um, I think, so there is an argument that if everything's determined, then there's no knowledge. Now, that argument, I don't think is very easy for me to make. Um, I do see that presented from time to time, um, but it's not sort of clear to me on the standard 
theories of epistemology that you couldn't have knowledge, even if it's determined in you. Uh, so to draw this out, um, one theory in epistemology of how you know things, and this is one that I, I like, is that knowledge is sort of fundamentally based in direct awareness or direct acquaintance. So for example, with my eyes, I can have direct awareness or direct acquaintance with shapes and colors. Uh, now there's a further question about sort of the nature of shapes and colors and whether shapes and colors are mind dependent or mind independent, but set that, that aside, I take myself to have direct awareness of shapes and colors. Um, and if that's right, I would say that that would be a basis for knowing that there are shapes and colors, even if my state of awareness was determined by prior states. The idea here is that I come into a state of seeing. Okay, now I'm gonna say something else I think maybe supports your intuition that if it's determined, then it wouldn't have knowledge. Um, and this is actually, I talk about this in my book on persons. There's a chapter on constructing thoughts out of mindless grains of reality. I think if the mindless bits of reality determine everything that happens, then I think that would provide powerful uh, grounds for undermining knowledge on the standard theories of knowledge. Uh, because I think the problem there is that knowledge usually implies some kind of rationality. You don't just believe it sort of just by luck or you know, without any kind of rationality. But rationality seems to imply that the cause of the belief isn't mindless. Right. You know, uh, it's sort of a visual aid. Imagine that there's wind blowing a tree and then the tree uh, just sort of randomly through the wind begins to carve into the sand random carvings. And imagine that you see in the sand a carving that says, I love you. Well, you know, that's just complete accident, right? right. Or, or I know I'm real, right? right. Um, now, now you might think, well, that's so unlikely that would happen if it were mindless. So you might think maybe there's more going on. Maybe there's a mind operating that tree. But if you knew that the fundamental, the fundamental causes, the original causes of this deterministic process, let's say, uh, were mindless, I don't think that you could have knowledge in that case. Right. So that might be kind of the intuition you're, you're pulling on there. Yeah, that, that's how it seems to me is, as I read a lot of arguments or, or assertions about determinism, it, it just seems that whatever on the other side happens on determinism, if determinism is true, it just seems like the antecedent is the thing that made this. Yeah. And so whatever this is, is just a product of that and there's this endless causal chain to something that we don't know what it is, which, so if, and if it, if it is says, I love you, or you're the most yeah. fantastic person, it's meaningless. It seems. Yeah. I mean, especially if it's mindless, I mean, and I could be wrong, but sort of how I think about it is if God um, was involved in a deterministic chain, even in his own mind, but his mind is like perfect reasoning, right. you know, well then perhaps there could be knowledge, right. In that right. case, but if it's mindless and I, and I think that, does provide a feeder for knowledge in my view. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're going to be cutting off pretty soon. And, and again, I, I can't tell you how much I really appreciate you showing up and helping me out. And even the things that you haven't done, I'm looking forward to your new book coming out. Uh, you want to give the title of it again for folks? Yeah, this is uh, who are you really a philosopher's investigation of the nature and origin of persons. And um, it's been kind of a lot of work the last few years. I've been working on it kind of obsessively, actually, probably more than I should. Um, but I finally have come to an end of my revisions. And uh, I've gotten a lot of feedback that has helped me to put the ideas together. And I was actually telling you before our time together that you helped me with this book because I saw your video, your first video about how reason can lead to God. And you said something in there that... Uh, was about something you appreciated in my book that I just like made a mental note. I was like, oh, that's helpful to me. You were telling me about how that I didn't bury the lead, but I just said kind of early on what I was going to talk about because I wasn't just trying to sort of hook somebody in with an advertisement and then, you know, hide, hide my cards. I sort of presented it right away. And so I thought, okay, that's helpful to know that, that you appreciated that. So I added a paragraph in this new book uh, where I basically do the same, the same thing. And it was really inspired by your video. And I thought, oh, the, and I read it to my wife. I was like, Rachel, does this sound good? She's like, that's really good. 
So oh, well, thank sweet. you for that. And, and I wanted to mention this because I think people underestimate how much they can positively influence other people when they are just genuinely putting themselves out there and sharing things. Like you would have no idea the positive ripple effects of your YouTube channel and the work that, that you're doing. And so I just think about this video, this random video that I came across on the internet <laughs> and it helped me. It, it affected the book and then that's going to affect all the readers. And so I just hey, wanted to thank you for that. Listen, I, I cannot tell you much. I appreciate that. And again, I, I think, thank you. And Rachel, thanks. Uh, tell, tell Rachel, thank you. And thank you again for coming on. I hope you will, will come on again, maybe another time when you have uh, some more time to talk with us about some different things. But it was great to get to know you. It was great for you to spend your time with us. And uh, I really appreciate what you do. And, and thank you so much for coming on, Dr. Rasmussen. Thank you. Uh, it was really a great pleasure. And I would love to do it again sometime. Thank you. All right.